Have we reached a tipping point on mass shootings? From the Patel studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News. Mark Niquette, reporter for Bloomberg News. Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist, and Joseph Moss, chair of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. Another week, another mass shooting in the United States. Last week, it was at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado. This week, there were two on the same day. One in Savannah, Georgia, killed one and wounded four. That one was quickly overshadowed hours later by the San Bernardino shooting that killed 14 and injured 21. Investigators are still trying to answer the question, why did a California couple go on a shooting rampage at an employee holiday party on Wednesday? The couple was armed to the teeth with assault weapons. It had thousands of rounds of ammunition and pipe bombs. The shooting once again prompted calls for tougher gun laws. So many Americans sometimes feel as if there's nothing we can do about it. We're going to have to, I think, search ourselves as a society to, to make sure that we can uh, take basic steps uh, that uh, would make it harder, uh, not impossible, but harder uh, for individuals uh, to get access to weapons. Joe Mas, is there anything we can do? There is plenty that we can do, and it starts with legislation. And I think that if it's going to start, it will probably start on the peripheries. For example, the assault weapons or the assault looking weapons. But we have the, the parallel problem in that the, the number of guns that are out there is just absolutely huge. Uh, they say that on the average, there are two guns for every household in the United States. And the accessibility to those guns then certainly make it easier for somebody to use it against someone else or even in a suicide. If you notice the president's statement there, he didn't say make it harder for people who shouldn't have guns to get guns. He said make it harder to get guns, period. Subtle change, but this was a more, more, more a tougher, more, a tougher gun control stance for the, by the president. Yeah, I don't, but I, I just don't see it going anywhere. Um, I think that the NRA is is very powerful, and I think that it, it has moved further to the right on on gun control issues over the past couple of decades. Um, you know, if you look back at at Ronald Reagan and his position on assault weapons, was that there should be a ban. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, there have been people who said, "Listen to your sainted leader of Ronald Reagan." If you really, um, that, that maybe it shouldn't be such a hard line on it. Um, but I, I tend to think that um, it's it's really not going to go anywhere. People get really um, worked up about this. Gun control is is the third rail, especially for Republican politicians. But if you look at the polls, Americans, a majority of Americans, support tougher gun control laws. This was, this was a poll from October. So before the latest shootings, 58% of Americans favor more strict gun control laws, 8% less strict, and 31% say they're just fine. If you look at just the universal background check requirement, 92% of all Americans favor universal background checks for everybody, 7% oppose. Among Republicans, nearly 9 in 10 Republicans support universal background checks for all. Mike Gonadakis, you say that 9 in 10 of your voting constituents support something. Why isn't it passed? Well, I don't know. We'd have to ask both Democrats and Republicans, because even Ted Strickland, the, nom the guy running for the United States Senate, opposes gun that's control. That's one. Okay, that's one, but there's many others. So the NRA, uh, Laura said it's just the right. Well, it's not just the right. There's many Democrats in the United States Congress that uh, are endorsed by the NRA, too. So it's an American issue. But, Mike, I think this issue of gun control is just another distraction, because I think the president is missing the point, and, and, and many uh, liberals are, too. This is an issue of radical Islamic extremism. This was terrorism. As we know now, so and then, terrorism. Well, it's, it's there. Pointing it's more there. and more towards that. More and more terror, and I guarantee by next week we'll, we'll know that for a fact. In the city of Chicago that has the strictest gun control laws, there was 2,771 shootings just this year. We're not done with 2015. So if it was a solution, stricter gun control, it would be working in Chicago, and it's not. I'm all for solutions. Mm -hmm. cause more gun control is not a solution. What no, if you no, had, but what the, it, this, this, this one in San Bernardino may be related to terrorism. However, most of the other mass shootings that we've had this year have not been. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think, I don't see it as a terrorism issue. Well, and most of them have been in cities with strict gun control laws like Chicago, so it doesn't work. If it's a solution, why isn't it working so why, in Chicago? So why isn't the argument, 
if, if, the, if the strict gun control laws in Illinois and California are not working, why isn't the argument make the gun control laws tougher? Well, if, if you're trying something that doesn't work, why try even more on something that doesn't work? Well, because it's very limited. I mean, uh, that's what the last Supreme Court case uh, came from, from Chicago, as to the accessibility. Yeah, it happened to be a shotgun, by the way. And the Supr Supreme Court said that that was too much. It went too far. That was in 2012, I believe. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in 2010. Uh, so uh, I think Mike is correct. I think we need to look and see what else is it that we can do as far as gun control in addition to a number of other things? Uh, when we have a mass shooting, now this one may be different to the one last time or the one the day before or the one that morning because there was another one I think in the state of Georgia even that morning. Uh, but that doesn't mean that gun control cannot be ineffective. Look at Canada. Look at the countries in Europe. They Mark, have tougher gun control, and Mark, they have fewer deaths of this type. I mean, Mark, in, in Ohio, I mean, this didn't happen in Ohio, um, but there was the situation at the Wexner Arts Center where a, a man, very despondent, former employee, came in, armed, shot a bunch of paintings. Apparently now we're learning, took somebody hostage briefly. Um, had that museum been crowded with patrons, it could have been much different. Instead of just paintings getting damaged, could have been people hurt. Uh, the State House, they're passing, you know, allowing guns in daycare centers and in police station lobbies, but no guns at the state house. So the Ohio legislature has to be similar to Congress and we're not going to pass any gun control. Yeah, it's been interesting because you, you've kind of seen uh, an inability of, of Congress or the state house uh, to enact stricter requirements or, or any kind of gun control legislation for that matter, sort of under the slippery slope argument. And this is something the NRA uses very effectively, the idea that if you do anything, it's sort of a prelude toward taking your handgun. Um, and, and that's where, you know, this recent episode might be, I don't know if it's going to be a tipping point, but I think the more you have these frequent kind of mass shootings, the harder it is just to say, well, we can't do anything because that might lead to something more stringent. So, you know, the more this keeps happening, I think there will be more pressure to do something. Now, maybe it isn't, you know, something dramatic, uh, but as as Joe was saying, something that could, uh, on the periphery, do something to help the situation. Let's not forget and it's a constitutional right to bear to, to own a firearm, sure. okay? Um, it's, it's in the Constitution, okay? So if we're going to continue to go farther than Chicago or California, or, or do we need a constitutional convention? Because we can't just go around the, uh, well, the, the Constitution. The Constitution does say a well-regulated militia, and, and that, right might, that might include an assault rifle that has a 30-round magazine. Wouldn't that be, if you, you, you can regulate that. You can regulate speech. The First Amendment sure. says free speech, but you can regulate speech. Right. Why can't you regulate guns? Look, I, I'm not pro-gun, I'm not anti-gun, but I'm, I'm anti-bad solutions, okay? And just to do something. If it's not working in Chicago, why go a step further? Let's sit down, let's have a grown-up debate, an adult conversation as opposed to political rhetoric. No, and that we, we should do. And by the way, on this uh, 2010 Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court specifically said that their decision on the broader term of being able to ban guns did not prevent states and municipalities from enacting regulations to those guns. And California Good did. California, California has California universal did. background checks. Yeah. California bans ownership of assault weapons, mm -hmm. which... An assault weapon was used just the other day, unfortunately, so it doesn't work. All right. Let's get... We won't solve it here, but hopefully it gets solved sometime. Topic two, John Kasich and his supporters continue to take on Donald Trump, and it looks like fellow establishment Republicans are rooting them on. Kasich's PAC is sending out mailers criticizing Trump for hiring illegal immigrants. And Kasich's campaign itself is out with a second web ad in as many weeks going after the GOP frontrunner. Now the poor guy, you got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh, I don't remember. He appeared to mock a reporter with a disability. He's going like, I don't remember. I thought, oh, maybe that's what I said. That reporter he is talking about is Serge Kovaleski, who now works for the New York Times. As you can see right there, he suffers from a chronic condition that impairs movement of his arm. Trump says he wasn't mocking the reporter because he didn't know what the reporter looked like. But in truth, they have known each other personally for years. He's going like, I don't remember. I thought, oh, maybe that's what I said. Despite Kasich's attacks and despite even more controversial remarks, Trump continues to lead in the polls, and a new poll out just today has him gaining strength in the polls. Mark Niquette, 
What's going on? Well, there's some who question the polls. I mean, how yeah. accurately does this reflect, you know, how the electorate's going to vote when it comes time to actual vote, voting? But, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, there is a, there is a phenomenon with Trump right now, and, um, you know, the, the Republican establishment, for sure, is, is worried about it. And I, I think, you know, what Governor Kasich's trying to do um, could actually benefit him in, in three different ways, actually. I mean, one, it's going to get him a little more attention because, you know, this ad is out there. It gets some free media coverage. You know, the idea that he's taking on Trump, you know, gets gets some attention and talked about. Um, and I think it, it probably helps from a, a Republican standpoint. The, the, those in the Republican Party that do not want to see Donald Trump as the nominee appreciate any kind of effort to, to take him on. And three, it sort of reinforces um, uh, Governor Kasich's, you know, sort of pitch for the nomination that he's... Uh, an he's an establishment figure who has the experience to be an effective leader and commander in chief where Trump doesn't. So emphasizing Trump's inability to serve that role sort of bolsters his own case. Um, Kasich's picture wasn't on that ad. And you had to look closely to see it's paid for by Kasich for America. It is, why is that? I mean, it had to be intentional. Why not put your face on it? He has other ads as well. I, I don't. Th I don't think he has to. I think it's very effective yeah. um, mm -hmm. using. And it's interesting because in in um, the videos that I think there have been two by Kasich for America and one by New Day, um, which is Kasich's pack, um, all show basically it's Trump's own words. They're using his own words against him. And they were, I think the Trump organization attorney sent a letter to New Day, saying, "Hey, you know, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to sue you." And um, they fired back and said, um, hey, listen, you're, you're probably violating federal campaign laws because you're a corporate entity. You're not allowed to be messing around with this. <laughs> so it was, it was funny. I mean, and they also yeah. said w their defense was, you know, it's only his own words. We're not making stuff up. We're not adding anything to it. How, Repub how f worried are Republicans that he will be the nominee? Mike? Well, I, I, well, some are worried, and some are worried that Hillary Clinton will be the nominee on the Democrat side. So, you know, you have good and the bad and the ugly. I mean, the last poll that came out by Quinnipiac, uh, Trump and uh, Hillary are both seen as untrustworthy people. So both parties have their warts, and ours is, is Donald Trump. If he's a nominee, so be it. And if Hillary Clinton's the nominee, so be it. You know, we, we get what we pay for, I guess, in our country. But at the end of the day, back to John Kasich, um, you know, he's a top-tier candidate still in New Hampshire. Um, he's fo That's his focus. He's on the ballot in 19 states and the District of Columbia. He's, no candidate's gotten that far. So he's doing his job. Now, if, you, if he asked me my opinion, which he hasn't, but I would stop spending my limited amount of resources and bandwidth on Donald Trump and focus on getting my great message, because John Kasich has yeah. a great if message. He, that's right. And, and if he doesn't have enough money for it to, to go around, I agree with you. I think that the negative stuff relative to Trump probably is not uh, doing anything other than it possibly helping, uh, helping Trump. It, and his positive ads are actually very good. If, his CNN, if the CNN poll is to be believed, the one that came out on today, Friday, Kasich really hasn't moved much. He's still around 2%. He he and he's today, in, in New Hampshire, the latest poll from last week shows him just about this, the 6 to 8% range. So he's about yeah. the same. I think it could help him in fundraising, though. I think that there, it could attract some uh, moderate yeah. uh, Republican support and who can, who can write some checks for him. As so. they're looking around for the Trump alternative or the Trump killer, you're absolutely right. I right. think that he's positioning himself well as far as that's concerned. And I think that is sort of the idea behind the case of candidacy, and that is he wants to be positioned, particularly in that establishment lane, as the alternative if and when the Donald Trumps and the Ben Carsons fall from, you know, voter um, um, excitement. Is it, is it more likely that Donald Trump stays at that 25 percent and other candidates drop off so somebody else comes up? Yes. But until yeah, think, someone like John price, Kasich yeah. or Chris Christie or Rand Paul... Until they drop out, at, then a... I think the rest of the field is too fractured. Yeah. Right. That's right. I think he is locked in. I think the percentage of the electorate that he appeals to is not going to grow. And if everybody else dropped out, and then we had Kasich remaining or Bush remaining, that they would then be showing 55%, 60%. Mark, does the pressure grow on candidates who are in that 2 or 3% range, like John Kasich, Chris Christie? to drop out before New Hampshire? Because what happens if Donald Trump wins New Hampshire by 20 points? Yeah, I don't think there's pressure to drop out before New Hampshire. I mean, I think, you know, at this point, you know, you're this far along, and if you have the resources to continue, you know, a candidate like, you know, Kasich is just geared towards New Hampshire. He's sort of betting everything on New Hampshire. So I don't think you'll see him drop out before. What will be interesting, like you say, is, you know, if the New Hampshire result is Donald Trump has either won Iowa or placed very high in Iowa and wins New Hampshire, 
you know, what does that mean for the in field? South going Carolina. Forward? I mean, that, that's fertile Trump territory as well. I haven't seen any polls down there, but that has to be yeah. at this point anyway. It is. We keep saying it's early, but <laughs> well, in this cycle, it's, it's, it's almost Christmas to see what happens because you know, in, in 2012, for example, you know, you had the caucus and the primary right after the holidays, and this year the Iowa caucus is until February 1st and in New Hampshire a week later. So we sort of have. I think some time for the holidays to be a pause for for politics before things really sort of get geared up after the the, the new year. And there is a sense that while we've been at this, you know, for I don't know, it feels like 50 years already. It's still kind of early in that sense yeah. that a lot of people really won't start getting engaged till after the the holidays. And we might actually see some movement, you know, after the first of the year, leading into the actual voting when it starts. All right. Topic three: Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor faces questions about her oversight of her staff. An inspector general report first unveiled that a former top aide to Taylor, Laura Johnson, visited beauty salons while on state time. Then the Columbus Dispatch took that same report and figured out that Johnson spent even more time conducting political business for the Kasich-Taylor campaign while she was supposed to be working. The supposedly independent inspector general is now taking heat for not highlighting and even not fully investigating Johnson's political activities. Johnson resigned from her position as Taylor's chief of staff back in 2014. Laura Bischoff, what are we to make of this? Is this a blip or is this a sign of something more serious? Well, I think that when she, when uh, her chief of staff, when it came out that uh, the chief of staff and the administrative aide uh, were both leaving the office, I think one resigned and the other one was fired, um, when that came out, it seemed like it was kind of bad because, you know, she was the, the former auditor. She's supposed to be all about controls and government accountability. And then we see that, you know, maybe that wasn't the case. She didn't know where her own chief of staff was. Now, this, in, this inspector general report, uh, the inspector general used to work for Mary Taylor in the auditor's office. And I think it, the, the story that Randy Ludlow had from the, in the Columbus Dispatch was fantastic. I mean, it was really uh, some good digging journalism, you know, laying down the, the, the records against the time, and, you know, double checking to see what they were up to. And I think the problem for Mary Taylor is that it's, it's fodder for, um, a attack ads against her in the in the GOP primary for governor in 2018, and also um, in the general. Um, what about the inspector general not pointing out the political ties, Joe Mas? Yeah, and that was uh, kind of interesting in that as well because it's sort of like he reported it and they just left it on the table. And I think he may have already entered into a an agreement, uh, or at least prosecutors did, on the. Uh, part there were there were two things that she was taking time off for personal things so on that issue they went ahead and and did a separate deal uh, represented by her attorney excellent attorney Terry Sherman and uh, she paid back the money and then apparently that's all we're going to hear about that now there is still the possibility of charges relative to the campaign side as the article pointed out Inspector General, inspectors general, Mike, have traditionally been thorns in the side of governors, regardless of party. This has not been the case during the Casey administration. Well, thankfully for taxpayers, it hasn't been because there hasn't been any scandals to, to investigate or anything that's risen to the level of that. Now, with, with Mary Taylor, she, look, guys, she did her job. When she found out that her chief of staff was doing something wrong, she turned it over to the IG, the inspector general. Inspector general did his job. The Republican county prosecutor and the Democrat city attorney, Rick Pfeiffer, looked at his report, and they decided not to press charges, not to prosecute. So when you have a Democrat and Republican law enforcement look at the IG's report and say, we're done here. I mean, what, what else can you do? Mary did her job. When you hire a chief of staff, you don't micromanage your chief of staff. You put them in place and you go off and you do your, your job. And, and if you have to micromanage your chief of staff, you got the wrong person in the job. And apparently Mary did. She fired her and off we go. Well, the problem with this kind of case is I think the inspector general's office has taken the position you can't, you know, prove that this was definitely political activity and, you know, a violation of law because, you know, these offices are sort of inherently political and you would be normally talking to these people as part of your official duties even if they're also affiliated with the campaign. But the problem is while that might be a high legal bar to, to meet in terms of actually filing charges, you know, the, the perception is, is an issue and that's why, you know, it's, it's always incumbent on these these situations to you know cleanly separate your political activity from whatever public or official business you're doing. And there's the trick. How, how do you do that? We have the governor of the state of Ohio who hasn't spent very, very very many at least more than half of his time out of the state. Where Joe, you're the you're an attorney, you're both Mike's attorney as well. But where's the line? She, this woman, uh, the chief of staff was appointed. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Governor Kasich is elected. At what point are you doing political business on state time? And how is it different for those two employees? Yeah, I think that if you're attending campaign activities, planning activities and so on, if I were advising her, I would say don't do it during state time. And it looks like it was happening during state time. As a matter of fact, on one giving day, she was attending a, a political a feedback session, and then later on that day, she was attending a class on not doing that. Uh, so, uh, it, and look, I, I, I don't want to say that this is just something that happens to Republicans. It, it, it's just an equal opportunity. I mean, these these are political okay? appointees. I, I, mean, I understand that. Yeah. But once it happens, yes, you can come under criticism for it, and I think it's fair for us to then say, hey, how did this happen? You say that you're squeaky clean and... Will there be, be a, there's been calls from Democrats to have an independent investigation aside from the Inspector General. Do you see that happening? Uh, no, because I, I don't see, the Democrats don't really control much, so they can make a lot of noise about it, but I, unless there's, I, I just don't see that happening. Okay. Highly unlikely. Our last topic in the State House corridors this week, shades of 2011 and the Senate Bill 5 protests. Okay. Union activists packed the hallways in the hearing room as lawmakers began consideration of a so-called right-to-work bill. The bill would prohibit companies from mandating workers pay union dues or make fair share payments to unions. Mike Konadakis, how badly do Republicans at the State House want right to work? Well, I think the concept in general is, is something that's supported by Republicans, and as a conservative Republican, I support it. But I look at it from a different lens. It's a competitive issue. If all the states surrounding Ohio had it and we were losing jobs, then I'd say, hey, we need to look at this. If this is the reason why corporations are not moving into Ohio, but Amazon just gave us a billion dollars worth of infrastructure and jobs. People are coming to Ohio. Jobs are coming to Ohio. We have labor peace in Ohio. Why would we want to upset the apple cart right now? If in a couple years from now that changes and, and, and corporations are moving to Indiana, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, because of the right to work issue, then let's revisit it. But right now, praise God, things are good. And we should mention that, that the right to work, as it's classically defined, and this started in the South, if I remember correctly, when I was there in the 1960s, uh, has to do with uh, unions not being able to have a closed shop. That yeah. you could have a union, but they voluntarily have voluntarily to have to Can't uh, be a condition to of donate. employment. Yes, right. as a consequence of that. So you can get a free ride if you happen to be a union member, don't want to pay the dues, or not be a union member. The union still represents you. But the union has less fair, power it. because it has less money and exactly. less influence over the, over the process yeah. if it has fewer members. Um, the, law, the shadow of Senate Bill 5, Mark, is pretty long at the State House. My, my guess is. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of appetite on the part of leadership to pursue this. I mean, when, when they asked the House Speaker about it, you know, he said, well, personally, I support it, but brought up Senate Bill 5 immediately. Yeah. So there seems to be, you know, some hesitancy about trying to engage after the, the voters have spoken. What we'll be interested uh, along the lines of what Mike was saying is if you do see activity in surrounding states, right now um, neighboring states of Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin sort of have right-to-work laws. And you're going to see, I think, efforts in Kentucky where you have a new Republican governor who's very strongly in favor of right-to-work pursuing it. And in West Virginia, the legislature there just held an out-of-session hearing on right-to-work. The Republicans control the legislature there and are interested in pursuing it. So if you see more of Ohio's neighbors pushing it, that will increase pressure on Ohio to do something. Does it help the economy, Laura? Is there any study that says union shops, non-union shops are better for a state's economy? Do we know? I think it's sort of a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, it's hard, uh, you know, it's interesting because I remember when we were covering uh, Senate Bill 5, there was a lot of talk about, well, what are the benefits of it? What are the, um, the drawbacks of it? And, you know, you can ask 10 different people and you get 10 different answers on it. And it's, it's, very, di it's very difficult to say that this one piece of legislation has the causal effect of big increases in, in jobs or uh, a big drag on the economy. That's, that's a problem exactly because the, the argument will be, well, you look at the job creation totals in right to work versus non to right to work states, but how much is based off right to work? And the same thing on the other side, the effect <coughs> on the middle class or wages and whatnot. Yeah, it's, a, it's an argument that the departments of development use in order to bring new business to the state. It's not necessarily to improve the situation of, of existing businesses. Okay, let's get to our final off the record parting shots and Joe Moss, we'll start with you. I want to let you know, Mike, that bipartisanship is not dead in the in this state of Ohio this past week. A House bill co-sponsored by my friend, Cheryl Grossman, uh, passed the House with a near unanimous vote. And House Bill 50 extends benefits for foster children until age 21 
rather than ending at age 18 and being aged out. So those kids are not now emancipated before they're ready. Mike. Ohio State student uh, wrote a, uh, an op-ed in a national journal uh, presenting her pro-life uh, conservative views and uh, on campus she's received harassing emails and, and uh, threats and the administration has turned a blind eye to that. I personally wrote a letter this week to the president of the university and I hope we can get this resolved uh, soon for her safety. Mike. I mean, Mark. Uh, one issue to watch in the new year that's going to be pretty contentious, I think, is the fight over how to restructure Ohio's unemployment compensation trust fund. Um, employers are not going to want to see a lot of higher taxes. Uh, workers aren't going to want to see benefits slash, but there has to be some middle ground because Ohio is one of only three states in the Virgin Islands that still has an outstanding loan from the recession to cover unemployment benefits, and one of 33 states that the federal government does considers not to have a solvent fund heading into the next recession. And Laura. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say after, you know, after Donald Trump has offended uh, uh, immigrants and Muslims and journalists and women and people with disabilities and even veterans, I'm, I'm going to say he's going to pick another group. He, he Carry out an insult and we'll see, the see Jews what happens. insulted the Jews this week, too, at the, that's at right. the Oh, that's right. Yeah, so. There's not many left. There's not many left. Yeah. Greeks? <laughs> that's You're next. next. <laughs> You're next. My prediction, uh, after the tragic death of an Ohio State student at the Mirror Lake jump, the Student Government Association of Ohio State voted overwhelmingly to end the tradition. I predict that one way or another, that tradition has ended, and uh, students will find something else to get themselves fired up for the Michigan game next year. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. We're on Facebook and Twitter. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.